Good morning. Good morning. And a very, very happy Mother's Day to you all. Um, I, I, I just applaud Tanaya for not just that ability to stand in what was an enormous trial, but the previous year she had another enormous trial and stood firm through it all with tremendous faith. I was praying for you this morning, Tanaya. You know, in, in, in war, in spiritual warfare, you can commit war crimes. You can do things wrong. Just like you can do in a natural war, you can also do in spiritual warfare. And I just was really pleased with Tanaya's dignity and honor and godliness with which she behaved herself through that trial. Can we give her a round of applause then? Thank you. I am very echoey, guys. No, no. I'm very echoey. Praise the Lord. On Sundays, just give me your attention a moment, folks. Eyes forward. On Sundays, not all Sundays are the same. Don't get locked into one set routine. Some Sundays we hear preaching. Some Sundays we hear we hear teaching. Some, like last Sunday, some Sundays it's about information. So don't get a set pattern or you won't be able to maybe receive correctly. Today I don't want to preach. I don't want to teach. I don't want to give information. I feel very much I want to prophesy. Okay? It doesn't happen very often. I don't feel liberated. I bring one word. But today's a bit different from that. I come from a family with a lot of strong prophets. My brother is a very strong prophet indeed, and like me, uh, except he's not walking with God. He, he did when we were kids, and he had an anointing on him as a young kid. And I remember I was running one direction, and he was running in another direction, and even as a little boy, the anointing was on him, and he stopped me. And he prophesied to me. He didn't know he was doing that, but he did. He prophesied to me and he said, you're going to do something great. And I remember that word just, I mean, he kept running. I stopped. I stopped because it was the first time in my life that I'd received something and I knew it. I could feel it. Amazing, isn't it? Words are powerful. And prophecy can be powerful. Now, understand how prophecy works. It's like God can speak a word or a person can speak a word. You're not complete at that point. You just receive the direction, right? And then you have to outwork that. So when my brother spoke to me, he created, he gave me that ability, that understanding of where my life was going. And that's what I want you to consider this morning, where your life is going. At the end of this meeting, we'll hand out notes to everyone. So don't panic about not getting notes this morning. I want to talk, please listen to me guys, I want to talk about you becoming someone great. Okay? Not about pride, I don't mean it that way. I don't mean, you know, self-centeredness or egotism, nothing like that. I mean that I, you're born again, I'm born again, right? Therefore there should be greatness. Our Savior is great. We should be emulating that. We should be aiming for something. And I want you to find that something, that something of greatness within yourself today. Maybe for some of you for the first time. I want to talk about the commandments of greatness. The commandments that will lead you to greatness if you will hear and obey. Just like the Ten Commandments. Eight of the Ten Commandments say no. And only two say yes. Now God is a very good God. I don't think God wants to say no. The promises of God are yes and amen. I believe it's in the heart of God to say yes. Isn't it? He's a, he's a yes God. But because of fallen nature, he has to say no eight times before he can say two yeses. Two commandments are yes. Eight commandments to get us to that place are no. So never be discouraged when God says no. That's a blessing. Amen. All over this world, there are people waking up in a prison cell this morning. 
Because nobody said no. There was no one in their lives who truly loved them. There was no voice. There's people on death row this morning. Because no one said no. People going from broken relationship to broken relationship to broken relationship. Because they don't know the meaning of the word. That's right. Sad, isn't it? You cannot be a father and not say no. There's a man in the Bible called Eli. He's despised. A wicked man, he was called. It says that when it came to his two sons, he held no restraint on their behavior. He was a father who never said no. Both sons died very young, prematurely. Because no one loved them, no one protected them. You cannot be a father, proper father, without saying no. You can't be a husband without saying no. Amen, man. <laughs> you cannot be a husband without saying no. That's female nature. That's why God put the man in authority. You can't be a pastor without saying no. You have to say no. If you love, you'll say no. If you do not love, you won't. My gym instructor, I told you, he's a hard man. I do a push day, a pull day, and a leg day. And, and, and I hurt my hip. So I text him in December. I text him and I said, I've hurt my hip and it's leg day. So I can't do leg day. And he said, okay, I'll see you in a minute. So I said, okay, I'm still coming. So I go in there. Leg day's over there. Push, pull. He starts walking towards leg. So I'm going, Michael, Michael, Michael. I said, yeah, he said, I got your text. Come with me. I said, but, but he said, no. I said, but, 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 no. And his advice was brilliant. He said, stop, listen to me. Who's the professional? That's right. And all over this world, you know, there's people who get injured every week. Every Saturday, they hurt their head, they hurt their leg playing football. And you're just like them. However, some people get injured and they keep the injury for their whole life. Right? So you've got a choice. You can either get professional help from me and do what I say, or you can have a problem. You know, have you got anything to say? So I said, I want my mommy. I don't like you. I'll take it. And he put me on my back and he added to the pain. He pushed my leg. I thought, where? Ah! And he pushed and he pushed. I hated it. But now I'm well. And sometimes you need to listen to the word no. Sometimes someone else knows more than you, better than you. And I don't care what age you are. It doesn't matter what age you are. Doesn't apply. We all need to hear the word no. All our lives. All our lives. I want to talk about the ten commandments of greatness. Ten things you can do or be, think like, behave like, that can take you to that place. And people will say, you shouldn't compare. You shouldn't say this is greater than that, or this person is greater than that. Sorry about that, but Jesus did. So Jesus spoke of John the Baptist. And he said this, Verily I say unto you, amongst them that are born of women, there has not risen one greater. And Jesus saw and declared John the Baptist to be the greatest among people in his day. Not just there, but in many other places. On Wednesday I was writing this message at home and I just finished typing it up. And I wrote down Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus the disciples came to Jesus and they said, who is the greatest? Praise the Lord. In fact, that was your first scripture on Wednesday night, Steve. Who is the greatest? I believe God's got a word for us this morning. For us as a people, he wants us to attain greatness, a greatness that glorifies him. Amen? Amen. But how do we get there? Eight of the ten commandments are no. And two are yes. The Ten Commandments of Greatness then. What greatness is not? It's not inherited. So you're not great because your parents were great. Or your name is Trump or whatever, you know what I mean? You're not great because you're born into some great family. It just doesn't work like that. In the scriptures it says this. In a great house, 
There are not only vessels of gold and silver, but there's vessels of wood and clay. In other words, just because the house is great, doesn't mean the people in it are great. You can have a great house, but that doesn't make you great. You can drive a great car, but that doesn't make you great. You can wear great clothes, like me. Oh, look at you. What do you got now? I never, you know, see when it comes to clothes, I get criticized all over the world. I can see people look at it. You know? Did he relate them when he got dressed this morning? Doesn't he know what the past is? You know, I'm dressed better than him. I get it everywhere I go. So, let me repeat. Jesus said of John the Baptist, who wore sackcloth and ashes. There has been no one greater than him. Jesus himself wore a seamless garment. Correct? And I've heard some cock and bull stories about that. God help us. Making dream. They want to buy a 700 quid Armani suit. So they want to make out that Jesus did. You know what I mean? You know where I'm going, right? Yep. That's inconsistent. He was born in a stable. Nice and simple. It says he ate bread and fish. Nice and simple. He removed his sandals. Nice and simple. So the Armani bit is not consistent. Okay? So don't add with traditions of men. I prefer to be available to all. Amen? I was in a church not long ago. You know the pastor. And I walked in that church. Every person in that church had a suit. I, in the middle of the council thing. And the pastor is crying because nobody joined this church. The guys are on welfare outside your door. Get a light. Get a grip. Don't enter into the traditions of men. Amen? Yeah. It is not a great house that makes you great. It's not great clothes that make you great. It's not a great car that makes you great. It's who you are. Yeah. End of. It's not inherited. Greatness, I'm not great because I've got wealth. There are many people with wealth who are not great people. Oh, Jesus, God help us. Wealth can corrupt. Terribly corrupt. Don't help us with this one. Don't let it corrupt you. Money doesn't make you better. Or worse. Don't see it that way. Don't view it that way. But I'm not great because I've got money. Money can affect my mentality. Because I've got money, I think I'm better. I think I'm great. It's not true. Poverty doesn't make you great. There's some people who think that. To think I'm poor and you're rich, therefore I'm better than you. It's not true. It's not true. It's very common, especially with my background in Ireland. That's a very common perception, or with, with the work that we did, Stephen. That this was a major trait within the people we worked with. They equated poverty to holiness, the Catholic thing. It's twisted. There's no place for it. These things don't make you great. Amen. It is not true. My talent doesn't make me great. And goodness knows this church has a lot of very skilled and very talented people, and we thank God for that. But don't confuse what you do with who you are. They're completely different things. And that's a real big mistake. And people can applaud you and thank you and admire you because of the things that you can do. When Jesus rose on high, he gave gifts to men, but that's not you. And always be aware of the God who gave you the talent. And honor the God who gave you the talent. Don't let your talent eclipse the Lord. I love to visit Loch Lomond. It's one of my favorite places. It's, you come down a little lane, actually, in a place called Lust. You go down a lane, and when you come to the bottom of the lane, it's like, boom. There's the mountains, the sea, the lake. It's beautiful. It's awesome. That's what it is. And I love to go there to pray. The last time I was down there, I was sitting down at the end. 
And there was three tourists came down, walked down the lane, and they were seeing things for the first time. And they went, wow! And one of the tourists got her camera, and she gave it to her friends, and she said, take a picture of me. All this stuff. And I, she had her back to me, but I could see her friends. And I could see their faces. You know what they were thinking? Why don't you just get out of the way? <laughs> Look at this. Look at the beauty of what God has made. But that woman just didn't get it. Amen? Don't eclipse God. Don't let your talent eclipse God. Your talent is not who you are. You can do many things, be many things, be gifted in many ways, in your business, in your work, in your whatever. But that's not who you are. Don't get those two things confused. My blessed wife rang me one day. I was on the way to work, and she was on the way to work. We just left each other about 20 minutes before. And my phone rang. We were both on bikes, and I stopped. I said, what? And she said, I just had a word from the Lord for you. Okay. What is it? And she said, God said to me, you're to write a series. And it's going to be called Men of a Great God. Okay. And she started to explain. You know the way you read books, great men of God. Great men of this. It's not that. And the word of the Lord to you is you're to produce something called men of a great God. Who's great? God. I said, thank you very much. And so I did. We went through, I went back and I went through scripture. And as I looked at each of the people, stunning bit of revelation. I could see how actually in every case it was God that was great. If you look hard enough, you'll see it. Amen? God is great. You're not great because of your talent. The God who gave you the talent is great. Don't confuse the two. Number five, we're not. Popularity doesn't make you great. Oh Lord, help us with this one. Be very frightened when everybody likes you. Be very afraid when your children love you and they're all set. When you're a sugar daddy, something's wrong. <laughs> right? You're coming home, you're giving them everything they want, blah, blah, blah. Something's wrong. That's not a man. Something's wrong. That's paying people off. That's silencing them. Not good. Popularity is dangerous. We had some very difficult decisions to make in some other countries this week. I've been traveling and, you know, you, when you have to do the right thing, it's very difficult. I don't care about that. That never bothered me my entire life. It never bothered me one iota. I don't care about popularity. I care about what's right. Amen? And if you're born again, my advice to you is do what is right. And when all men are praising you, Jesus said, be careful. Because they killed him. And in your workplace, when you're the one who has to say no, in your neighborhood, in your church, in your cell group, whatever it is, if you're a person who's always saying yes, the Bible says that's not love. You understand that? It says it's not love. And I tell you, in every case that I can ever remember, people who don't love don't get that part right. They don't understand it. They don't understand the nature or even of the Ten Commandments where Jesus tells us eight times. I want to say no to you about this and no to you about that in order to get you to the place I want you to be. Greatness is not cheap. That's why not many people are great. It's not cheap. A noble wife, a few weeks ago we did a message here as a single. A noble wife who can find? It's a question. It means they're difficult to find. It means a noble wife, don't blame me, read your Bible. It means a noble wife is hard to find. That's what it's, that's the inference. And it's the same with greatness. Who can find greatness? Because it's expensive. Greatness is costly. You have to walk right, live right, be right. And people do not want that price. They don't want to pay that price. Do you want to be great? Do you still want to be great? Well, wait till we get to point eight and then you can answer. Do you still want to be great? 
Because the greatness we're talking about here reflects the glory of God. That's the only thing it does. The greatness we are speaking of is not you. John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he will increase. The greatest man, Jesus said. It's not cheap. You didn't get it from your parents. Don't let money change your attitude to yourself or deceive you about your greatness. Don't let poverty do that. Don't let your gifts or your skills do that. If you do, you're going to lose your way. Greatness is not immediate. It takes time. That's just human nature. If I give an altar call today, and I call you forward. Some people get such a crazy idea in our day, in this age. Somebody laid hands on me, therefore I'm great. <laughs> you know? That's what happens. That's what happens. Completely deceived. Reinhard Bonke laid hands on me once. So did Tommy Barnett. So did Caesar Cantiana. So did John Bevere. And I value it. I'm not despising it. Not at all. But you know the effect that can have? Absolutely nothing. I mean, you have responded at altar calls, haven't you? Yes or no? Yes. What difference did that make? Think about it. Think about it. Greatness is not immediate. That's the, one of our cultural modern day problems. So and so prophesied to me, so and so said ABC, so and so laid hands on me, and therefore everything's okay. Everything's not okay. Everything's not okay. You have work to do. You have a part to play. Amen. It's not immediate. When I, I thank God for my leader, Rick Seward, I thank God with all my heart for the impact and input he's had on my life. No one has said no to me more often than him. And when he came into Dublin, you will remember, when he came into Dublin, I was the senior pastor there, and one of the first things he did was he stepped me down and he put me on teas and coffees. That's a bit of a jump. So... Uh, in, the, in the first few weeks, I didn't know what was going on. And I thought maybe I would be on the teas and coffees for a week, or two weeks, or three weeks. No, two years. So, you see, my to, to, to develop whatever God has called you to do is not immediate. And when he came into that place, he looked at me and he said, the most gifted, and this is true because our people were pretty rough, the most able person in that building was me, by a long shot. But my spirit was fine. I was proud. I was this, I was that. So do you know what he said? Sit down, we'll use someone else. And for two years I sat there. But in those first few weeks, the immediacy of greatness, wanting it now, the ultra call mentality. You see, in those, I remember sitting out with the boiler boiling by my side, Abigail, wherever you are, with the, with the boiler boiling by my side, thinking, what's gone wrong? What shall I do? And as in those moments you make life-changing decisions, when I'm stirring the tea, I came to a conclusion. I'm not in this church because I get used to it. That's not the criteria. That's my problem. I'm not a member here because Pastor Rick says, you're going to do this or you're... That's not why I'm here. And if my talent or my skill has taken, it needs to go. Amen? What happens if you're on the worship team here and we say, you know what, sit down. We don't want you to do anything. We just want you to sit. How do you feel about that? You know your ministry, we want you to step down from it. Oh, well, you know what? <laughs> well, what's the criteria for you being here in the first place? Why are you here? Is this about you or about God? And I thank God for wise leaders with long-term vision who, and someone who can tell you the truth. And he's did exactly that. You swear as well, right? Yes, I. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then work out of your system whatever needs to be worked out of your system. Greatness is not immediate. And let me, as this is Mother's Day, let me say to the wives, to the mothers, and to the husbands, Maybe you think your marriage is not great. Marriages, I deal with marriages more than any other thing. All the time. 
But praise the Lord, I had another success in a neighborhood. Absolutely in a neighborhood. That was a divorce situation. But we managed to get them back on track well into a great, great, great outcome. Now, a great marriage is not immediate. And marriages have seasons. I had a bad marriage. In a short time, it was two years of a bad marriage. It was my wife's fault. <laughs> two years of a bad marriage. But because I stuck at it, we ended up... What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was my fault completely. Because we stuck at it and realized that some things are not immediate. And people met us in our third or fourth or fifth year. And many people saw this out and said, that's what I want. I can see it. I have people talking to me, even people who don't even know us, could see from a distance. They could feel the love and the energy. Amazing, isn't it? Oh, Jesus, God help you. And see, many people would look and think that was immediate. It wasn't immediate. It wasn't immediate. We had terrible times. We had bad days, bad weekends, sleep on the sofa. You know the story. If you don't, you will. <laughs> Hallelujah. A great marriage. You might need to change your sofa, get a bigger one. A great marriage is not immediate. Greatness in every area is not immediate. And don't get that McDonald's attitude. Amen? Number eight, and this is an important one for me. If you intend to be great, if you, in the biblical sense, you cannot have a competitive spirit and you have to remain teachable. People need to be able to talk to you, to approach you and to speak into your life. That has to be the case. Now you're all nodding and I know you very well and some of you are totally unapproachable. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you need to be approachable. You need to be teachable or there's no greatness in the end. So be warned. Be warned. Don't be competitive in ministry. I have got no competitive streak in me at all. That's all beaten out of me years ago. Hallelujah. <laughs> you need to get it out of your system. I'm a kingdom guy. Right? Church and kingdom, two different things. Jesus built both. He said, I will build my church. Right? And he also talked about the kingdom. Having one or the other, that's not an option. You have to have both. You have to understand the nature of both. Right? But I'm both. I'm a church guy. I'm under the protocols and principles of structure and system and biblical ethics. But also I'm a kingdom guy. Janet's ministry, for example, Wayne ministry, that's got nothing to do with this church, right? It's a completely independent ministry. Have I blocked you? Did I support you? 100%. Simon, from the minute I came here, I blocked you, right? No. And when he comes to me and says, I want to do this church, I want to do it. every time. I do everything I can, no matter what the, I don't care who they are. Within reason, of course. Go out there and preach the gospel and see life change. I'm not competitive. Be a bigger person. Be a bigger person. Right? I will support anybody who wants to glorify God. So if that's your goal, you will have my support. If it's not your goal, you're knocking the wrong door. I repeat, if you want to glorify God, you will have my unwavering, unending support. True? Amen. And please raise up others. Thank you for receiving Jojo, by the way. I asked him to come. Jojo exemplifies many young men out there who nobody will give them experience, nobody will take them in, and he and many others, we need to help them. We need to be friends. Be a big person. Be a big person. I, I want him to come. I want him to learn. I'm going to give him more opportunity. And I mean, anybody here, Stephen, if I asked you to preach up here five, the next five weeks, you're going to make mistakes. In five weeks, you'll make a mistake. Correct? Yeah. You know what you need then? Faith people. You need congregations to be big. Great. And they put their arm around you. And say, go back, get up, Steve, have another go. Don't be small, be great. Don't be small-minded. Be great. Support, help, encourage. And when somebody falls over, you pick them up. Because guess what? The day's coming when? 
you're going to fall over. So don't shoot the wounded. Help the wounded. That's what it's not. And you look inside yourself and see those things, any of those things within you, get rid of them. Jettison them. Dump them. Once again, I, I thank God for Rick because he's taught me more than probably anybody else. When Jesus was walking one day, he worked a miracle and everybody was so blown away by it that they said to him, well, he could see that they were going to go and tell everybody his name. They were going to tell everybody what happened. Remember what Jesus did? He said, shh, tell no one my name. I don't want anybody to know my name. Shh, quiet. And he stopped them. You see the humility there? See the grace there? Fantastic. That's true greatness. And over the years, as we've been producing many things, say we're producing flyers and booklets, and Rick comes in, he's taught me. See if I do a booklet like this? He'll walk in the room, see if he sees his name, take my name. He doesn't want his name on it. Wonderful. He turns to the back, I've got his picture, take my picture. I don't want anybody to know who I am. And I've done that many times in many, sorry, many scenarios. And that is a great example, isn't it? Let him increase and let me decrease. And that's why I've followed in this structure for all these years, over two decades. And I warn you, friends, greatness will come through mentorship. We're going to get there. It's going to take time. I need to change your mentality. Greatness will come through mentorship. It always does. So I don't want you to get the idea that somebody's going to lay hands on you and it's going to happen. That's not the way it works. Paul, Timothy, Moses, Jethro, Moses, Joshua, it's a person. Greatness, you developing, is going to be a human being. That's what's going to happen. And you need to be open to that. You need, as we said last week, you need to be ready for that. But finding that person, finding your mentor is difficult. Scripture says this, whoever you choose to follow, study their lives closely. Because guess what? You're going to replicate who that person is. You know, it's a statistical fact that no one earns more than 13% more than their five closest friends. So your friends are best. Your friends are, are, are affecting you in ways that maybe you don't realize. That's just a financial term. Nobody earns more than whatever, 13% of their five closest friends. But I would say to you also that no one is probably more righteous in their walk with God than their five closest friends. Because they'll drag you down. And you need to look at your friends. Scripture says this, he who walks with the wise grows wise. But he whose friends are fools they themselves will suffer harm and you're going to become a fool. It's a fact. It's a statistical fact. You analyze your friends. Who are your friends? You are going to be like them if you hang around with them. So be very selective. Be very fussy. I repeat, Scripture says if someone is leading you or affecting you, study that person's life carefully and make sure that the end result, the reason I follow Rick is because the history, 40 years of fruit all over the world, 40 years, and that's a good history. And I advise you, your leaders, what's the history? And you be careful of those choices. What greatness is not, and then to conclude what greatness is, it's not what you do. Not what you do. Can you just put that down a moment? What you do. Just put it down. Put all your qualifications down. Put all your talents down. Greatness is not what you do. Greatness is who you are. <coughs> Very different thing. Many horrible people. Immoral people living in great houses. With lots of wealth. Many very skilled people in Hollywood. Los Angeles, and you know that they're rotten to the core, correct? But they're just talented. Purple. 
Greatness is not what I do. It's who I am. And lastly, great people are great people. All of them. I was looking at um, this lady here singing this morning at the opening of our meeting. I was thinking, is that Andrew? <laughs> That's not Andrew, is it? Is that Andrew? Is that the same? Is that? Excuse me, are you Andrew? <laughs> Wow. Transformation, huh? Jesus. I don't know about you, but I can I could feel you know, the presence and the power of God so powerfully there. Amazing. Fantastic. Great. Anything that glorifies him? That's great. Yeah. Let me say this to you, Andrea. Excuse me for doing this publicly. She asked me to help her in terms of worship. Mentorship and all that, and we'll get around this system as the days go by. When Andrea and JD do anything here, don't you think it's great? Yeah. Absolutely great. But I want to say to you, both of you, don't let the greatness be a passion so much for what you do. Be great. Be great all the time. In fact, make this, in some way, the least important thing. So that when you walk through that door today, in your mind, is a walk of greatness. A walk of greatness. And then this will look after itself. And door after door will open for it. Greatness is not what I do. And if I'm truly great, I'm going to be great all the time. Not just when you're doing whatever it is you do. Think of John the Baptist. Jesus, John the Baptist. He didn't have a church. He didn't have proper clothes. He didn't have any food. He even didn't even go to the people. Maybe. He went into the wilderness where there was nobody. Yeah, like John Wesley, preaching to nobody. And whatever happened, people found out about him. And they all walked out into the wilderness, remember? Amazing. That's greatness, isn't it? God help us. So I'm prophesying to you today, and I want you to receive it as a word, as something that you can find within yourself, whatever true greatness God has called you to. Get rid of all this worldly stuff as we proceed. I have many meetings after this meeting, but I want to say a few words to the men before Michael has his his meeting. Guys, can it please give me your heart and give me your attention? All over the world, the other faiths are different from us in one major point. The Muslims have more men than women, vastly more men. The Buddhists have more men than women, and they lead everything. The Hindus have more men than women. The only faith on this planet where the men are weaker is Christianity. Right? It's absolutely true. And it varies. It gets worse in some cultures. It gets better in others. I work with many cultures. Some cultures I can't find one man. There's males. And they're in church, but they're not men. You know what I mean? They're not men. They're scared of the women. Women dominate, and I, I bless the women for what they've done. But there's a problem, guys, that has to be broken. Michael's formed this group, Real Men. And I want you to consider your ways, man. The Bible says the woman is the weaker vessel. But to be honest, in a lot of marriages, the man is the weaker vessel. He's weaker in prayer. He doesn't want to give. She has to twist his arm. He won't get out of bed on Sunday. Get up! She's pushing to get to church. House after house after house. The woman is not the weaker vessel. The man is the weaker vessel. True? Sad but true. Wouldn't it be great if we changed that in you? Wouldn't it be great if you guys stepped up? 
Now, I've been both sides of this divide. I was a, an appalling husband. I was a poor leader. And I know what that feels like. And then I changed completely and became a leader of my home and a good husband. Let me tell you from personal experience. You don't know what you're missing. You don't know what you're missing. If only you would start to lead your home, lead your family, and be... I know it's embarrassing because you feel like a hypocrite. But just start doing it. Just start doing it. And woman, don't stop him. And don't criticize him. Don't pray like that. Don't say it. <laughs> just be quiet. Right? Let him pray whatever way he wants. At least he's trying. It's true. That's what they do. Don't be the weaker vessel in prayer. Don't be the weaker vessel in giving. Don't be the weaker vessel in church involvement. And I'll say this to all guys, because I'm a guy. I come from the same background as you. Before I got saved, I played snooker all the time. I loved those clubs. I used to hang around with my mates. And then when I got saved, some of my Christian friends also played snooker. But it's the same thing. And in those clubs, and it, it, you know... Human nature has a bad habit of sinking to the lowest denominator. And in those clubs, my attitude to my family began to change. And it was getting worse, not better. I had some bad friends. They were Christians. But they weren't affecting my marriage good. And I had to make a decision and a bit of a revelation. This is the revelation. As a single man, I can have those pals and my mates, and I can enjoy myself. But once I'm married, the number one priority is my wife and children, not my mates. I'll say it again. Once I'm married, my number one priority is my wife and my children. And if my mates are affecting the moral standards that I execute in my home, it's the mates keep the wife. Amen. 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 You need to get some noise here first. Okay? This is not automatic. You do not have an automatic pass. It's not an escalator. It's not going to take you. You've got work to do. You've got soil to till. You've got changes to make. And I'm prophesying to you just like my brother prophesied to me. There's greatness ahead. It's what you were born for. Born again for. Greatness ahead. You know you know the story how we grow not to 7, 7 to 14 and all that. I honestly believe, Michael, you know what some of the men, some of these men grew when they were younger, but they stopped at some point, many when they got married, right? They stopped. <laughs> they, you know, I run, I do marathons. And what you do, when you, you just got to keep going, but at a certain point, say a half marathon, at a certain point, you get what's called a second wave. Comes at about 15K. You feel as if you're finished. You feel as if you can't do it. And the body's an amazing thing. Something kicks in and you get a second blast. And then you're off. It's fantastic. And it's almost like freewheeling. It's great. And you know what these men need? A second win. You remember the growth spurt that you had back then? You can do that again. Amen? Are you up for that? Jesus, help us, God. One last thing I'll finish because it's Mother's Day. It's the week of prayer and fasting. And please take seriously what Pastor Richard said. I was at the last two, and I was utterly overwhelmed. I mean, totally overwhelmed. Valerie was leading on the Saturday. I think mean, Steve, you and Nana were here, and Valerie was leading. And uh, and maybe you don't think I was rude, but I walked out because I couldn't, I couldn't stand. I couldn't stand it. I was overwhelmed. I was out at the Park for a while. And I was crying, and then I just went home. I was overwhelmed. I was unable to cope. I was ready to explode with the presence of God. Don't miss next week. Okay? You don't know what you're missing. The last one, again, Steve, forgive me for running out of the room when you were preaching. Yeah, but you see, you were prophesying. So I went straight out because I wanted to write down what you said. I needed to send it to someone. If that was full-blooded. You disappeared at one point. Remember that? He just disappeared at one point. He had diminished and God got through. He's good at that. Hallelujah. Next week. All week. And by the way, let me say this. Don't worry about coming with a goal. We'll have goals. The team will prophetically come up with lists and agenda. That's all fine. But 
in my experience, people stop coming to prayer meetings. Please hear me. People stop coming or they don't bother going because they say in their head, I went last time and I didn't get an answer. Yeah. That's what they think. They think, I went and I prayed about this and it didn't happen, so I'm not going again. That is one big mistake. Amen to having goals and having targets. But you don't need to get an answer when you come to the prayer. Let me finish. That's not the answers and goals are not the only thing that coming here is about. It's not the only thing. It's about you getting into the presence of God. What's that song we sang? Incense at the beginning? Incense, right? In just a moment, I want to sing that again. But let me finish what I want to say. Some of you aren't praying. You're making a mistake. Some of you backslide, you lose your way. Listen to me. In the Old Testament, people like me, a priest, would drag a bullock into the temple and cut its throat. And the blood would flow through the temple all day, 24 hours a day, that blood flowed. And then the priest would slice the body of the bullock open, cut it open, and you can imagine the stink and the smell. There was the organs. It was a stinking, bloody mess in that temple, right? And that went on all day, all night. It was the symbolic of the butchery of Jesus Christ. Now, in the middle of that place, the priest, because of the smell, you've got nodules in your nose that make you throw up when you smell blood and you smell poo and all sorts of stuff. When they cut the animals open, it was everywhere. It was a mess. Well, one of the things the priest did is they got a censer, incense. And the smell of the incense made them able to keep the bloodshed going because it was necessary. You with me? It, it didn't solve the death. It didn't solve the problem. It just made them able to endure. And yes, we want answers. Yes, we seek it. But understand this. If you say to me, excuse my French, you understand what I'm saying. My life is a bloody mess. Well, that's what that was there. There was blood everywhere. There was a stench everywhere. But those priests understood something. When we get the prayer, it simply gives us the ability to endure. So, yes, answers. But you come along next week and just get the strength from God to endure this walk that you have in these difficult days with God. Can we sing that song in sense again, please, worship team? Stand with me, folks. I'm going to ask Richard to, to, to pray with us before the worship team sing this. Open your spirit and start to ditch anything in your life which is clouding God's work in you towards greatness. Just stay focused one moment.